out uh, back here. Well, let's pray. Father, we do just uh, rejoice that we can study your word together, that we can continue this look into heaven with the Apostle John last week at the throne of God the Father and now this very important episode that takes place that John's able to reveal to us the concern over who is worthy to take the scroll. Lord, we're thankful that that uh, you are worthy, that you are our Savior, the Lamb who has redeemed us. And Lord, we uh, just pray this look at this passage, the song that it's sung would be meaningful to us because it's really our song. It's the song of the redeemed church. And so use it to minister to our hearts. Encourage us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, as we said uh, last week, chapter 4 was looking at the throne of God the Father. And with everything we said, just to summarize a couple of things based on the symbolic language, the colors that were used, the references uh, in the Old Testament, uh, certainly the things that we want to come away with is the fact that with the rainbow around the throne uh, of God the Father speaks of his faithfulness, uh, the colors of the, the Sardis stone uh, and the crystal-like or diamond stone we talked about, talked about his moral purity, his holiness, uh, his faithfulness, and his love for us, and we went into some detail about that. But I think, again, as we, you and I, one day are before the throne of God the Father, all of those things will be meaningful to us, reminding us of, uh, again, uh, the price that was paid for our salvation and so forth. And we get to a uh, a very important chapter here in chapter 5 is it really begins the, the trigger for, uh, for the coming of God's kingdom. And the, what begins that is uh, this issue of a scroll that's written on the outside and the inside indicating its, in, its importance. The fact that it's being held in the right hand of the Father, again, in court, in, uh, uh, letting us know that, uh, that this plan and that kingdom is part of his sovereignty, and it's not a maybe, this is going to, to happen. Uh, but the concern in heaven is the, is the question is asked, who is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals? And we'll see that it's a, an elder of the church of the redeemed, uh, that is there to say, I know who it is, because it uh, is of great concern. Because what it does, as we'll see in our study uh, next week, is that, uh, of course, it is Jesus Christ. He takes the scroll. He'll open the first seal, which is a judgment. And then the, the seven seal judgments begin. The seventh one then begins the trumpet judgments. There are seven of those. By the time the sixth one is completed, we're halfway through the Great Tribulation, a three-and-a-half-year period. And when the seventh trumpet judgment begins, that ushers in the seven bowl judgments that take place for the next three and a half years, which conclude with Jesus Christ returning with the church to planet Earth to rule and reign for uh, a millennial for his uh, thousand year reign and then on into eternity. And we'll get to that in chapter 19, 20 uh, and, uh, and so forth. But it's the idea of what begins the kingdom of God? What ushers it in? And it begins right here. Uh, and that's the concern. That's the question. Let's look at the first five verses. There is one who was able to open the scroll. John says, And I saw on the right hand, hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll, written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals and no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. First thing we note, as I mentioned, it's God the Father who is holding the scroll, indicating again that uh, he has all power and all authority and all, all sovereignty in terms of these uh, world events and the coming of the kingdom. He holds the destiny of the lives of everybody uh, in his hands. Sometimes we wonder about that and wonder when our own lives are seemingly going out of control, but uh, uh, the Lord is is holding the affairs of, of the world and certainly directing them. We know, secondly, that it's a strong angel who, uh, who asks who is worthy. And, of course, 
Uh, I think most, man, uh, most English translations have the word scroll. A few might have, have book, but it is a scroll, as I said, written on the outside and the inside, but it's necessary for somebody to break the seals and be able to read it or begin or trigger in the coming of God's uh, kingdom. Uh, this would be familiar to John. In, in Roman law in that day, a will or testament would have to have seven seals on it. You know, those wax seals upon it to secure it, to make it binding, to make it legal. John would be very familiar with this concept, this idea. But who can open it? Who is worthy? Who is it directed to? Who is the, you know, again, the testator or the one that is allowed to open the scroll and be able to initiate what will come from it? And, um, and we see in the book of Daniel the, the same kind of concern. Uh, the events of the future, including the tribulation, not the kind of details we get here, are given to Daniel and the events. That's why we know the sequence of the timing and how long and so forth from, from Daniel and our study there. But in Daniel 12, 4, it says, the angel is saying to, to uh, Daniel after this prophecy, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. And then in verse 9, the words are closed up and sealed till the time uh, of the end. So uh, here is the scroll that's going to, is sealed up, but it's going to be opened by Jesus Christ. The word strong for, uh, for the angel here indicates the importance uh, of the angel. And we've seen uh, several different types of angels and, and beings. And we're going to read in a moment about the untold number of angels that are around the throne of God at a particular point in time, uh, still, still future, to worship the Lamb as well as the Father. A strong angel. A lot of uh, commentators believe that this is actually Gabriel, whose name means strength of God. Uh, again, part of the coming of God's kingdom and, and certainly a, a portion of what we're going to be studying is the horrific judgments that are brought up upon a Christ-rejecting world. But part of what's going on as well is that Israel's going to be saved. You know, Israel's back in the land uh, in 48, Israel, Israel establishes their capital again uh, in Jerusalem uh, in 1967. Uh, Israel, we know that at a point in time, will be attacked by a confederation of uh, Iran and Russia and a few other uh, Islamic states, and God will deliver them. We know that everyone will turn against Israel at some point in time in the future, and we're living in, in those days. Uh, those, those days could be could be weeks or months uh, away from us. You know, one of the scenarios that's going on right now, some, uh, some intelligence reports would indicate that Iran could have their nuclear weapons uh, within another five, five months. We're hoping to go to Israel in about a year. I'm not sure if we'll be in our glorified bodies and we're all going or if, uh, uh, or if it's, uh, you know, the regular type of travel. But, uh, but nonetheless, uh, if that happens, and uh, of course Israel will launch a preemptive attack, they won't allow themselves to be destroyed. And when they do, Iran will mine the Straits of Hormuz, cut off 40% of the oil supply in the world. And the economy won't be real good then worldwide. And there'll be a few people around the world that will be a little bit ticked off at Israel for starting all this. All the world's going to turn against Israel in the end, and we seem to be living uh, in, in those days. Uh, Gabriel seems to be tied directly in Scripture with the nation of Israel. So if it is Gabriel, very appropriate, the strength of God. It's a strong angel uh, that is concerned about who is able to trigger the events that will save Israel and will usher in the, the kingdom of God. But notice, thirdly, it's an elder who announces the one uh, that has prevailed. And... Um, and certainly, we as the church know quite well who is the mediator of the, uh, of the new, com uh, new covenant. And notice the titles that are, uh, that are mentioned here. He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Occurs 155 times in the Old Testament, nine times in the New Testament, but six times uh, in the book here in Revelation. And goes back to Genesis 49. Genesis 49, eight, Jacob's at the end of his life, or Israel. He brings all of his kids in, his adult kids that represent now what would be the 12 tribes of Israel or the, uh, later the nation of Israel. And he prophesies over very accurately over each one. And notice what he says to Judah in verse 8. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. 
Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah, Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who shall rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver between his feet until Shiloh comes. Jacob, or Israel, says to his son Judah, you're going to be like a lion, and there's going to be something unique about you as a lion because the Messiah is going to come through you. Shiloh is just another name for the Messiah, and he's saying that the Messiah will come before uh, we lose the power to execute capital punishment, rule ourselves, before a time comes when the scepter that rules is taken before the law is removed from us. And, and of course, uh, Israel lost that in the Babylonian captivity and then regained it again. Uh, and, then, and they had it during a period of time and then lost it uh, 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 once again. But uh, during Jesus' time, they had it. Uh, and Jesus, as a little boy, you remember, we wonder sometimes, why is that episode included? Jesus, when he's uh, 12 or so, and he's in Israel, and Joseph and Mary head back, and with a caravan of people, not realizing that he is not with them, and are very concerned. And they rush back to find him, and he's in the temple, confounding, the, again, the great rabbis uh, of his day. What is that all about? Well, it's because a few years later, the... Uh, a Roman procurator named Caponius ends up taking over and they lose the ability to execute capital punishment and ends a time period from which the Messiah had to come. The Messiah had to come before that, before they lost this ability to really rule themselves even under the Roman uh, emperor. And the rabbis wept in the streets because they had, the, the Messiah had not come. Shiloh had not come, or at least if he'd come, they had missed him. But he had come. He was a little boy in the temple, 12 years old, confounding them. But uh, again, Jacob here prophesying over his son Judah and saying that it's going to be through you the Messiah comes and you're going to be known as a lion. Therefore, the lion of the tribe of Judah uh, is just another name for the Messiah. He's also the root of David. The root of David is referenced in Isaiah 11, verses uh, 1 and 2. Very important that the Messiah would come through Abraham, then through Judah, and then he had to be a descendant of David or David. Uh, and, uh, and we know the promises to David that the Messiah would come and he would rule on his throne and reign forever uh, and ever, the root of, uh, of David. And we have, why we have two genealogies in the New Testament. We begin with, with um, Joseph's genealogy in Matthew because he's his legally adopted father. But we also have the genealogy in Luke's gospel of Mary because, again, it would be through Mary, his bloodline had to be able to be traced back to David. And, of course, Jesus fulfills all of these things. But, again, these titles reminding us of, of a couple of things. One is the fact that when Jesus came the first time, he's going to be referred to as, as the lamb, the lamb that was slain. When Jesus came the first time, he was the lamb that was slain. He was the fulfillment of Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, to die for the sins of the world. Uh, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. But at the same time, there were all the prophecies of him coming as the conquering king, and he will as the line of the tribe of Judah. So John is able to see and puts both of these images together, the image of the suffering servant, the lamb, which we all understand of sacrifice and sacrifice for our sins and so forth, but at the same time as, uh, as the lion. One speaks of his first coming, the other one speaks of his second coming, about which has everything to do with this scroll because it's the trigger that sets everything into motion. In verse uh, 6 and 7, it continues, and we see that the one who is worthy is the Lamb. John, John says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a Lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came back and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So the first thing we note that the one who was, was worthy was like a lamb that had been slain. It's just an idiom. It's a figure of speech, and it means Jesus died and he rose again. Uh, he was a lamb as though he had been slain uh, because he is no longer 
dead. He is alive. He has risen from the, the dead. And, uh, and again, notice the creatures around the throne of God, in the midst of the throne of God, there to worship him. And in the midst of them, we find Jesus standing. And that's very significant uh, because everything we've talked about up until now and everything we study for the most part of the New Testament is the fact that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God where he makes intercession for you and I. Remember when he was before, uh, before the high priest and... Uh, uh, and being questioned, Mark's gospel tells us, but he remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? He says, I am, and you will see me sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. Many references sitting to the right hand. Why? Because his work was complete. It was finished when he purchased our sins. When he rose again, he sat down at the right hand. But we have an exception, don't we, early on in the book of Acts. We've got Stephen, who is the first martyr of the church. And as he's being bombarded by stones, and we're talking big ones, uh, to kill him, he's being crushed by them, and he looks into heaven, and it said his, his, his face glowed as that of an angel. He looks into heaven. He has a glimpse of Jesus, and he's not sitting at the right hand of God the Father. He's standing. He's standing to receive Steve, Stephen, the first martyr of the church. And here again we have... Uh, this very important episode where Jesus stands uh, once again. And when he does, all heaven kind of, because something very dramatic is about ready to take place. We were uh, always impressed when we get to go to uh, military functions. We were at uh, a good friend of ours that uh, retired from the Air Force uh, after uh, 25 years. We were out at, um, at Hickam for his, uh, his ceremony and everything. And it uh, the military has the concept of authority <laughs> and honor down, down pretty well. And when certain people walk into the room and stand, so does everyone else. <laughs> and they are erect and they are sharp and all eyes are forward and nobody moves. And it's just like, wow. And, uh, and that's a little bit of what's going on here, except it's all of heaven. <laughs> when Jesus stands from where he was and he is now before the throne, all heaven stops, everybody's at attention, there is no time, but if time could stand still, it would be standing still at that moment. So very significant that he is standing. And then again, the mention of the fact that his condition that he had been slain. It's interesting in the Greek, it's a present tense, which means it's very interesting, it's continual action, but he was. He was slain, and now there's a continual action that continues into the future. He was slain, died for all of our sins, and there's a continual result that does not stop, that we kind of miss in, in the English. But uh, here he is in heaven standing as a lamb that had been uh, been slain. And again, we're, we're familiar, if we've studied the Bible enough, with this idea of the sacrificial lambs in the Old Testament. It was John the Baptist that introduced Jesus in his ministry, saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then notice the, the horns are symbols of his power and his uh, authority. Seven, uh, speaking of the perfection or completeness of that. Uh, the seven eyes referring to the fact that he is uh, all uh, omniscient or all-knowing. And uh, if you've ever had one of those school teachers that could, had eyes in the back of their head, you know exactly what, the, what we mean by that. Did you ever have those? I had one of those. It was terrible. I mean, he'd be writing on this, the chalkboard and, this, and suddenly know that somebody was doing something. And I, I don't think he could do this today, but he would take an eraser, not the chalk, but the eraser. Turn it. If you were kind of spacing out like I would have a tendency to do one. Nothing worse than getting hit upside the head by an eraser. The best teacher I ever had. <laughs> he was a good guy. But uh, eyes in the back of his head. Uh, but it means that they, they know things they shouldn't know. They shouldn't be able to know. They know all things. Uh, and that's the idea. All powerful, all knowing. It's, again, the symbolic language. And, um, and John combines, again, the two missions of Jesus. The suffering servant as well as the conquering king. And then also notice that the one was worthy to take the scroll, and it's from God the Father, reminding us that it is God the Father that gives the kingdom to, to the Son. Jesus here on earth said, I've not come to do my will, but the will of the one who sent me. Made other remarks uh, about that. So again, it's God the Father on the throne, 
in his right hand, and now all, Jesus stands and all heaven stops to say, you know, and then who is worthy? Who can take the scroll? And John is weeping at this point because nobody's saying anything. Uh, but again, it's an elder of the church representing the redeemed church in heaven that says, we know who it is. It's the one who was slain, but rose again for our sins. He's the one that's, uh, that's worthy. And it's God the Father that, again, initiates all of this as the scroll goes to the Son. The third thing is that the one who is worthy is worshipped with a new song. Very interesting, verses 8 to 10. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. So the new song is sung by those that are around the throne. It includes the four living creatures that we were introduced to last week. Of course, they, they correspond to what we see in uh, Isaiah's vision as well as Ezekiel. And... Um, and then the uh, 24 elders, they fall down before the, the Lamb, an act of humility and submission, but they sing a new song. And um, I don't know if anyone noticed who's playing the, the harps. I'm taking great encouragement from this, though. It's the elders, which represents the church age believers. So if you've ever struggled with those guitar lessons, no problem. You're going to get a harp in heaven. Somehow we're going to be able to play it. And uh, look forward to that. Some people say, so what are you Christians going to do? Just kind of like hang around heaven playing harps? Pretty much. Yeah, that's going to be one of the things we'll be doing. All right. But uh, uh, well, what's that going to be like? Well, consider the other place. You know, you might want to get into the harp thing. But uh, it's, it's the church that's there. And um, the elders are holding bowls representing the prayers of the saints. And, and of course, uh, again, this takes us back to the, the Old Testament, the altar of incense, and those, that incense that was burned that would literally rise and, and then were symbolically representing the prayers of the saints that were, were going up to God. In that Old Testament setting, certainly representing uh, the prayers that we pray, uh, you and I, uh, currently they, they rise, the Bible tells us, like incense to the, the throne of God. Now, some, in some church settings, they still do that. They still burn incense and reminiscent of the Old Testament and so forth. Uh, if you've got allergies or stuff, you're probably glad we don't do that. But, uh, but nonetheless, it, you know, you don't, it's possible to do the symbolism without any sum, substance. It's possible to burn incense and actually not be praying. But uh, it's supposed to be symbolic of the prayers that are, uh, that are, that are going on. And, um, and sometimes I think that we, we forget this. And so you know, sometimes symbols do help us a, a, a little bit. A, a number of years ago, when when um, when we were when we did go with Pastor Bill and Danita to Israel, there was one church they uh, usually go to on the tour, which is an old Crusader church uh, right there in Jerusalem. It was uncovered, excavated, beautiful, all stone, very high uh, ceilings, Gothic looking. But the acoustics, and it's not any bigger than than this building here. It's a little chapel, and uh, but the acoustics are unbelievable in terms of the the echo 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 go i mean you can just say one word and it just you can like almost watch the word you know going going up to the ceiling uh, it's amazing so we would uh typically go in and it's usually just us and uh, it's about 40 of us so we sing some worship songs and stuff just acoustic and you don't you never sounded so good i mean i don't know what it is about the acoustics of that place it's like uh 10 times over singing in the shower kind of a thing and uh, it's just incredible, but you really have the sense that as you're singing, it's, you, it, you can almost, you can hear the words rising and then hitting the top of that building and, uh, and spreading out. And it certainly reminds us that when we sing, when we worship, when we pray, God is on a throne. He is listening. He does hear them literally, and they rise to him in the same way incense would rise. And here in this very dramatic scene that we're allowed to see, where the kingdom of God is about ready to be triggered and ushered in because Jesus Christ is worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. We've got these 24 elders representing the church age believers, and here they are with bowls in their hands, 
Again, we're already in heaven, and this is preparatory for the unleash of what we call the great tribulation, uh, but we've got the, the prayers of the saints, which uh, leads to a little bit of speculation, but are these the, the prayers that have already been prayed in the past? Possibly. Are these the prayers that are, that are being prayed right then and will continue to be prayed during the tribulation period? And that's a possibility as well. Uh, if, if you finish the study here, if we get done with Revelation before the rapture, then when you're in heaven, you're going to know what's going on on earth. And, uh, and, uh, and perhaps we're interceding and, and praying for others at that time. Uh, we don't know, but it's certainly suggestive, uh, at least in, in the language here, that that's a possibility. The, th the second thing about this, the new song confirms the lamb as worthy, and that's certainly the, the focus here. Uh, the Greek word for new song means it's new, not new from the standpoint of time. Uh, it's not like, hey, never heard this one before, uh, but it's new in terms of quality and uniqueness. This, he says, and then we will sing a song that is incredibly unique, and it's unique to the church age believers. We're going to sing about how worthy uh, the Lamb is. And we end up proclaiming four different things. Because it tells us why the Lamb is worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. One, we've already mentioned, it says again, he's worthy because he was, he was slain. And, uh, and certainly just to read through Isaiah 53 and understand what Christ went through on our behalf. Uh, and we are there and, and he will be there and he will bear the marks. Uh, remember when he appears, those 40 days, and Thomas, the sometimes people call him, uh, honest Thomas or, you know, Thomas the cynic or whatever, but he wants to see for himself. And Jesus reveals in his resurrected body his scars, and that's why he knows. So Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, will, will bear those scars, and we will see them one day in heaven. And when we do, we'll be reminded constantly that he was the Lamb that was slain. Peter says in 3.18, 1 Peter, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. He's worthy also because his blood was the price for our redemption. Our redemption or being purchased, and that was the word that was used for buying a slave from the slave market. That purchase price was the redemption. And with your blood, you purchased men for God. It says uh, in, in the NIV. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's why he is, uh, he is so worthy. Our redemption is not based on our personal performance or any achievements we might attain in the name of God, the name of Christ, or religion, or anything else. Our salvation and our redemption is solely based upon uh, the blood of Jesus Christ. The third thing uh, about this song we will sing is that he is worthy because the 24 elders represent every tribe, tongue, uh, and people in, in nation. Of course, it's at the instructions of Jesus in, in, uh, in Matthew 28, where he gives not the great commission, but the great command to go into all the world preaching the gospel. And um, there's so many things about heaven that will be just, just so incredible. And we, you know, when we went through First, First Thessalonians, we talked about the rapture of the church and how uh, how we will be caught up together with them. We who are still alive and left will be caught up together with them, those that have died before us, in the air with the Lord, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Uh, and we spent some time talking about the fact that it means there will be a moment in time when we will all be rejoined together with every family member, every loved one, every person that we knew that has died in faith in Jesus Christ. It means anything to us. In a moment in time at the rapture, we will all be together right at that moment. It's very, very specific in the original language. Certainly that'll be glorious. Uh, and now you have these scenes about worshiping uh, around the throne of God, seeing God the Father, seeing Jesus as the lamb that was slain, but at the same time, he's the conquering king, he's the line of the tribe of Judah. But we're not just doing that with just us here <laughs> and just our, our family members that, uh, uh, and friends and neighbors that have come to know uh, Christ, but uh, it's going to be with all believers, and they're going to be from, from every nation and every tongue and every tribe and every people group on, on the face of the earth because of the Great Commission, because people went out and fulfilled the great, the great Commission. I just think it'll be a, a glorious time. 
uh, a number of years ago on one of the trips with the uh, high school youth group. We were in Japan, and we were working one day with uh, Campus Crusade uh, guys that we knew there, and we were going to do evangelism at train station, hand out tracts and, uh, and CDs and things. Uh, and so we met... Um, a couple blocks away in one of their offices just for a time of uh, prayer and worship and uh, uh, an intercession uh, before we kind of launched out for, uh, for the day. And there was as many of their staff there as there, as there, there was us, probably 25, uh, uh, 30 people kind of jammed into this little office building all, all on, the, on the floor, gathered in there and uh, worshiping and stuff. And then they said, you know, we've got uh, folks on staff here with us uh, that are from China and from Korea, and, uh, and they mentioned a few other places. And, and, uh, and because of that, you know, we translate everything to English and try to work on our Japanese as much as we can, which uh, everything had been translated up to that point. But we just want to have a, a, a time of prayer that we do, and we just encourage you to join in with us, where we just kind of allow everybody to pray in, in the language they're most comfortable with that they grew up with. And, uh, and so we did. And it was chicken skin. I mean, to, to be, I'm not talking about speaking, it's not because they were praying in, in Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and, and whatever the languages that were represented, English and so forth. But it was just, it was just, a, a, it was just a glorious thing to hear people praying, interceding, and then begin to sing and, uh, and worship the Lord. And, and to know that you're, you're part of something in terms of the gospel that is so much bigger than your culture and so much bigger than your little neighborhood, and so much bigger uh, than your own thinking in terms of the power of the gospel to transform lives no matter where someone is at, what condition they're in, what culture they were brought in, what, what kind of moral upbringing they had or didn't have. The gospel can penetrate through all of that and lead men and women to faith in Jesus Christ. And you got, we got a little, a, little, a little glimpse of it. You know, and of course, we're like, to the kids, are you getting this? Is, is, is this? I hope this is meaningful to you. I think it was. Some of, a lot of the kids commented on that. It was one of the coolest things that, that happened on that particular trip. But it'll be an amazing thing. And we would certainly say the Lamb of God is worthy uh, because of the fact that he has uh, saved from every tribe and tongue and people uh, in a nation. And even, of course, for us, it's just the amazing thing from our little church. Uh, somehow, I think we're going to become aware of the fact of the lives that have been touched around the world through, uh, through your going, your giving, your praying, and, uh, and all that we've done. Just from uh, here at, at our fellowship, there'll be people there from Japan, China, Thailand, Cambodia, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Israel, and even Dallas, Texas. And they do speak a different language there. But, uh, of course, speaking of Stratton Durain, that's been with Gospel for Asia uh, for a number of years. Well, let's go on. The fourth thing about this new or unique song we will say that sing is that we would say he is worthy because of our relationship to God as kings and priests. And certainly that's been made possible by his redemption, and we've made reference to that again, that one day we will rule and reign with Christ, not autonomously, but, but under the authority of, uh, of Jesus Christ, and, and, uh, and that will be an amazing thing. And it's mentioned once again here in this song of redemption, the new song that the church will be singing in heaven to the Lamb as he takes the scroll and is about to usher in the kingdom of God. Now, a couple of things. There's a textual thing that uh, needs to be mentioned here because if you're, if you're reading along in a, in a New King James or a King James, then you, you read what I just read. But if you're following along in an NIV or a New American Standard, then in verse 10, it reads very differently because in verse 10, also in verse 9, it reads as though the elders are not the redeemed church, that they are talking about someone else. Uh, you would have in the NIV, you have made them, not us, you have made them, not us, to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God, and they, not us, will reign on the earth. So just a couple of things uh, uh, about that. One is that uh, if, you, if you read a bit like I do and you read other commentaries, uh, and some of them that favor the NIV, New American Standard, you're going to have, hear language like, like uh, uh, they translated it this way because of so many manuscripts indicate this is the way it should be translated because of the older, more reliable manuscripts that said this is the... But in reality, there's only one manuscript. You have many manuscripts. You've got one 
that indicates this language in that particular tense and all of the others indicates that it's speaking about us and us already being in heaven. And you can see why a theological position about the rapture of the church, about the tribulation could override why somebody might choose that particular uh, manuscript. David Hawking in his book, Coming World Leader, says in Revelation 5, 9, the removal of the word us after the word redeemed is found in the Codex Alexandrianus. And that just means it's the manuscript that was found in Alexandria, Egypt. And the majority of the manuscripts readings, whether early or late, contain the word us. So there is one, but there uh, is one only. And uh, uh, David goes on and says, when we read uh, about the new song sung to the Lamb of God by the 24 elders, we are reading about our response as the redeemed church in heaven, constantly glorifying and worshiping the Lord, singing songs of praise for his marvelous redemption. No wonder so many Christian songs speak to the Lamb of God and his worthiness to be praised. It's one of the, the first point. And here it's the, the whole of heaven now worship the Lamb of God. I had to come up with another W. I was kind of struggling with it. So I had to go to a, uh, a euphemism used by preteens and teens in the 20th century in the southwest region of the United States. And that word is enchilada. The whole enchilada of heaven now worship the Lamb and the Father. And that means uh, heaven in its entirety now, now are worshiping. Let's look at uh, the whole enchilada worshiping in verse 11. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Same with a loud voice. Here we are with that loud stuff in heaven again. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. So first thing we note is the Obvious, it's all of heaven that worship uh, the Lamb. In terms of how many angels are worshiping, all of them. <laughs> and, uh, and this is an idiom. It just means there were, there were too many to count. It's like saying the sands on, on the seashore. Uh, there were thousands upon thousands and, and so forth. The other interesting thing about this, uh, it speaks about every creature that was involved of, of uh, this remarkable praise. And, um, and does the whole of heaven include the animal world might be another question that comes to, uh, to mind because we kind of have these issues once, once in a while. We, we talk about this idea of um, will all dogs go to heaven? No, nah, just the ones that are baptized. I'm a little worried about that, though, because I've baptized quite a few geckos over the years. But uh, <laughs> that's where they go when I catch them. They get baptized. Uh, but it, it does, it's, very, it's a very interesting statement that uh, at this time, not only is all of heaven worshiping and all the redeemed of the church, all of the angels and so forth, but all of creation and all the creatures of creation are, are worshiping as well. Now, Paul gives us a little background on this in Romans uh, 8, 19, because he's talking about the fact that, you know, creation as it is, is not like, not like it was meant to be by God. Uh, and, uh, and it is suffering as well, just as you and I are not who God uh, meant us to be either. We suffer uh, as well. In fact, uh, it's uh, Paul in uh, Galatians that says, uh, but the whole world, but scriptures declare the whole world is a prisoner of sin. Uh, so it certainly has its uh, impacts. Look, listen to what he says in Romans 8, 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation is waiting for something. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered, the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans 
and, the, and labors with birth pangs together until now. Paul says that creation is not how God meant it to be with hurricanes and tidal waves and, uh, and uh, raging fires that uh, cause so much uh, damage as we're seeing uh, this summer. And creation itself is, is groaning, waiting for a day of, of liberation as well. So you take that with the idea that it's subjected to this futility, uh, it's suffering, creation and creatures, but one day uh, everything will, will worship the Lord. Does that mean little dolphins will jump out of the water and go, I don't know, praise the Lord? I don't know, but, uh, uh, I don't know, but I, I, I obviously things will be in a, a different dynamic than they are and they are now. So can't really settle the issue of uh, if uh, Fluffy the cat will be in heaven with you or not. But uh, it, it is, it's, it, but there's, there's nothing that says that uh, that won't happen either. So the, it's just a couple of interesting passages here. But either way, the, the dynamic is, is that uh, everything will worship God one, one day. Paul says, of course, in, uh, in Philippians that... Um, that uh, every knee will bow uh, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Future tense. This says, yes, it's going to happen, and it's going to happen right as this time as, uh, as uh, God's kingdom is being ushered in. The second thing about this, this worship that's going on, all of heaven will worship with what we might say true adoration. Notice the contents here of the song. They are declaring that his are power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, uh, and blessing, indicating the, the fullness of the worship and that he, he totally deserves to, uh, to be worshiped. And then Seven of those characteristics are repeated again in, in verse 13. And then lastly, all of heaven will worship the Father. They declare, the, again, the same, the blessings, the honor, and the glory and power to God the Father, the one who sits on the throne. So, of course, that'll be a tremendous day, you know, for us. And I think the, the takeaway from this is that we obviously don't have to wait till that day. God has ordained praise and uh, it's a way that, uh, that we can uh, worship him now through song, but uh, ultimately through our lives and the way we live our lives. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So whatever you're doing in your work, whatever you're doing in your school, if you do it to the best of your ability, there's a way that you can find to, to do it to the glory of God. And, and God can be glorified through even the, the most simple things um, in, in our lives. But this chapter is meant to really, again, as the last chapter, to help us see and glorify God the Father and get a better understanding of his uh, place and position in heaven and what it means to us and what it will be like to be there with him one day. Uh, John opens because this book is the revelation of horrible events. No, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's how we began in chapter one with a very different picture of Jesus than maybe we had previously. And certainly this, we've got to have this understanding before we move forward with uh, anything else in the book. I, I just wanted to close with a, a pretty lengthy quote, but I think it's a pretty good one that might help us uh, kind of bring this to a close. By a, a man named Kevin DeYoung, uh, don't know much about him, but this is from an article he wrote, uh, Who Do You Say I Am? Remember Jesus up there and uh, Caesarea Philippi saying, who, who do they say? Who do the people say that I am, but who do you say that I am? And uh, certainly it's an issue that everybody must deal with at some point in time. He says in the article, quote, The greatness of God is most clearly displayed in his Son, and the glory of the gospel is only made evident in his Son. That's why Jesus' question to his disciples in Matthew 16 is so important. Who do you say that I am? The question is doubly crucial in our day because no one is as popular in the U.S. as Jesus. And not every Jesus is the real Jesus. There's the Republican Jesus who is against tax increases and activist judges for family values and owning firearms. There's a Democrat Jesus who is against Wall Street and Walmart for reducing our carbon footprint and printing money. There's a therapist Jesus who helps us cope with life's problems, heals our past, tells us how valuable we are, and not to be so hard on ourselves. There's Starbucks Jesus who drinks fair trade coffee, loves spiritual conversations, drives a hybrid, 
and goes to film festivals. There's the open-minded Jesus who loves everyone all the time, no matter what, except for the people who are not as open-minded as you are. There's the, there's the touchdown Jesus who helps athletes run faster and jump higher than non-Christians and determines the outcome of the Super Bowl. There's the martyr Jesus, a good man who dialed, died a cruel death so we can feel sorry for him. There's gentle Jesus who is meek and mild with high cheekbones, flowing hair, and walks around barefoot wearing a sash while looking very German. There's, there's hippie Jesus who teaches everyone to give peace a chance, imagines a world without religion, and help us, helps us remember that all you need is love. There's yuppie Jesus who encourages us, us to reach our full potential, reach for the stars, and buy a boat. There's spirituality Jesus who hates religion, churches, pastors, priests, and doctrine, and would rather have people out in nature finding the God within while listening to ambiguously spiritual music. <laughs> There's platitude Jesus, good for Christian specials, greeting cards, and bad sermons, inspiring people to believe in themselves. There's revolutionary Jesus, who teaches us to rebel against the status quo, stick it to the man, and blame things on the system. There's guru Jesus, a wise inspirational teacher who believes in you and helps you find your center. There's boyfriend Jesus, who wraps his arms around us as we sing about his intoxicating love in our secret place. There's good example Jesus, who shows you how to help people change the planet and become a better you. And then there's Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. Not just another prophet, not just another rabbi, not just another wonder worker. He was the one they had been waiting for, the son of David and Abraham's chosen seed, the one to deliver us from captivity, the goal of the Mosaic law, Yahweh in the flesh, the one to establish God's reign and rule, the one to heal the sick, give sight to the blind, freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim good news to the poor, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. This Jesus was the creator come to earth in the beginning of a new creation. He embodied the covenant, fulfilled the commandments, and reversed the curse. This Jesus is Christ that God spoke of to the serpent, the Christ prefigured to Noah in the flood, the Christ promised to Abraham, the Christ prophesied through Balaam before the Moabites, the Christ guaranteed to Moses before he died. The Christ promised to David when he was king. The Christ revealed to Isaiah as a suffering servant. The Christ predicted through the prophets and prepared through John the Baptist. This Christ is not a reflection of the current mood or the projection of our own desires. He is our Lord and God. He is the Father, Son, Savior of the world and substitute for our sins, more loving, more holy, and more wonderfully terrifying than we ever thought possible. I think that's part of what John is trying to help us see in the revelation of Jesus Christ, because I think it's our tendency to make him over in our own image, which is called idolatry, by the way. And, and this book is meant to help us get him back on the throne and see that there's gonna come a day when everything in all the universe all of creation, including you and I, and even demonic entities under the earth, they will all bow their knee and they will all worship.